I am kicking off a new series today called Seeking God. I've been really excited about getting ready for this series because at the beginning of the year, that's really where we go. The beginning of the year, we always want to start the beginning of the year with seeking the Lord. Now, I want to give you a working definition of the word seek so we can just know because we're going to have seek week and then we're going to have the seeking God series. So what does it mean for us to seek? You'll see that word all throughout scripture and over the next four weeks or so, we'll unpack what that looks like in different ways. But I want to give you a working definition of the word seek, and the word seek is this. It means to go in search of, to pursue, to discover, and to obtain. I love that. To go in search of, to pursue, to discover, and to also obtain. And that's what we want to do the beginning of this year is we want to go full force after God. We want to seek him with all that we have you know, we're all seeking new things in the new year. I mean, we're all seeking, as, as Pastor Stephen said, maybe you're seeking a new diet plan. Maybe you're seeking, you know, uh, a new relationship. Maybe you're just seeking a better relationship. Maybe you're seeking a, a baby. Maybe you're seeking to get rid of your babies. Um, we're all seeking something in some form. We're all, we're all after that. But here's the truth, whether you're after a, a new job or a, a new spouse or a new whatever that may be, none of that really matters if you don't seek the first thing, the right thing, and that is seeking God. I want to start this series off, though, before we get into what, how we should be seeking the Lord, and that'll, there'll be elements of that in this message But I want to start off today with actually asking a question that I don't think we ask enough. And here's the question, and it's actually the title of today's message, and that is, what is God seeking? What is God seeking? I know we're all seeking something. Maybe you're seeking relief. Maybe you're seeking healing, as we said. Maybe you're seeking a new change in some regards. But but can we just start the new year, one of our first services together, and just ask this question, what is it that God's seeking? What is it that he wants? I mean, no, we just want to do what he wants. If we want to look to him and see. And so I want to, we're going to go to 2 Chronicles 16. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles 16, 98% of our time together today. And it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. We're going to jump around in three different chapters there. We're going to read a good bit of scripture today. Um, We're we're about to get a spiritual scripture exercise this morning. Are y'all ready? We're going to pump out the Bible this year. That's another thing. We're going to read a lot of the Bible this year and uh, because I know that you guys can handle this. So we're going to go ver- chapter 16, verse 9. This is kind of the theme verse for this message, and it says this. It says, the eyes of the Lord, what's that word? Search. The eyes of the Lord search. God is seeking. God's pursuing. God is looking the whole earth. He's looking on throughout the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. This is what God is doing. God is on the search. He's on the lookout. And he's looking for people whose hearts are 100% committed to him. So if you, if you got your notes, rave them at me if you got your notes. Come on, we're starting out the new year. You got a notes, okay. All right, by the way, if you want to start a new year with a new binder, go grab one, okay. Get one, get you a binder and all that. Those are free. But here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the point. God is seeking people who are wholeheartedly committed to him. This is what God is seeking after. There's a, a number of things that God is seeking, but today, to start this whole series and this whole year, I want you to hear me when I say that God's greatest passion right now is he's seeking people who are wholehearted. Everybody say wholehearted. Wholehearted. Wholeheartedly committed to him. Wholeheartedly committed to him. Now, I think I've shared this before, but uh, if you're new here, you'll, you'll hear this. I'm a, I'm, I, I love watching documentaries. Uh, I'm just one of those kind of guys that enjoys it. Some people hate that kind of stuff. I absolutely, anybody love watching documentaries in here? Just a couple just behind the scenes type of things. One of my favorite documentaries that came out, and this is because I grew up as an avid sports fan, still really love sports. And so anything that's kind of a sports documentary, I'm really fully engaged in. And so growing up my whole life, one of my childhood heroes, really in all of our family, was Michael Jordan. Uh, Michael Jordan was such a huge deal. And so in 2020, they came out with a documentary. This is the documentary that came out. It was called The Last Dance. Has anybody seen it? I don't know if anybody's seen it in here. Three of you. Okay, so this will go well. All right. (laughs) If you haven't, maybe you could care less or not. But for me, this was like, I was like all engaged. Uh, It was a 10-part docu-series, 10 hours. 
And, and what I loved about it was it was 500 hours of behind the scenes footage that they had gotten 500 hours and they condensed it down into a 10 hour, pretty much a 10 hour documentary, this huge documentary. Um, and, and what it did is it gave you 500 hours of behind the scenes kind of takes you into conversations and things that, that you didn't get to when you were watching it. And I watched the Bulls growing up most of my life, watching all their championships and, of course, following Michael Jordan's career and journey. But this documentary, you got to see something that you don't normally get to see when you're just watching games. And that was that you got to see how they handled stress. You got to see how they handled pressure. You got to see uh, what they were thinking in the moment when it came to that championship and that game. What were you thinking? And there's something about being able to look back and to get an inside look at how they made the decisions, what were the frustrations, what were the hardships, what were the victories, what were the triumphs, and then also what were, what were the trials. I bring that up because today we're going to kind of do a case study as well. We get the opportunity to go into a man's life. He's the king in the Old Testament, and his name is King Asa. Everybody say King Asa. And so we're going to do kind of what the last dance did for Michael Jordan. We're going to go do that for King Asa. We're going to go get a behind the scenes look at King Asa's life. Now we get to kind of do a little bit of a case study to see King Asa was a man after God's heart. He was so fully, wholeheartedly committed to the Lord. And we're going to look at what were some of the things that made him. Now, as we read just a minute ago, 2 Chronicles 16, we're going to begin in 2 Chronicles 14. So we're going to go back two chapters, kind of to the beginning of the introduction of King Asa, and we're going to look there. And I want us to start today by answering this question is, what is it to have a wholehearted commitment to God? Because I can't be something if I don't know what it is. So what does it really mean for me to be wholehearted? If God is pursuing people that are wholeheartedly committed to him, then what does that actually mean? What does that look like? And King Asa gives us an incredible kind of portfolio of what this looks like as a person. And so we're gonna give you four kind of things on the wholehearted commitment. Then we're gonna do a, a, a switch and I'm gonna show you in a minute of what's gonna, what's gonna play out. So first thing is this, if you're taking some notes, a wholehearted commitment to God means this, that you remove anything in your life that is not of God. That you remove anything that is in your life that is not of God. So let's go to 2 Chronicles 14, verse 2. As I said, we're going to read a good bit of scripture. So you're going to want to follow along with us. And uh, we're, going to work those, we're going to work those reading muscles. It says this, Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord his God. He, what did he do? Removed. He removed. He removed the foreign altars and the pagan shrines. And he didn't just remove them. He smashed them, smashed all the sacred pillars, and he cut down the Asherah poles. Next verse says this, and he commanded the people of Judah to do what? Okay, so he's commanding all of, all of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, to obey his laws and his commands. And Asa also removed the pagan shrines as well as the incense of altars from every one of Judah's towns. So there was, there was all of these pagan shrines in every single town. So it wasn't just enough where he was that he took them and smashed them and removed them, but he went to every single city. He went to Welsh and Hathaway and Elton and Iota and Gadon and Roanoke and Lake Arthur and Jennings. Okay, so he went to every one of them. And he says, we're gonna, anywhere in here that is not honoring to the Lord, Take it down, remove it, but don't just put it in a closet, destroy it. We're going we're gonna to take it out. We're going to demolish this thing. So Asa's kingdom enjoyed a period of peace. During those peaceful years, he was able to build up the fortified towns throughout Judah. This is huge here. This is a, a part of what he did. And no one, look at this next verse says, and no one tried to make war against him at this time for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. So the first thing that King Asa does is we, we see, okay, this is a guy who's pleasing to the Lord. He loves the Lord. 
And when he first gets into power, we're not sure what his age is, but as soon as he comes into power, all of his predecessor, his father and his grandfather and all those that were kings before had allowed some, some pagan worship to come into their cities. And when he became king, the first thing that he did is, we gotta take all this out. This does not honor the Lord. We're gonna, we, gotta, we gotta get it out. We gotta get it out. Now, um, one of the things that I try to do at the beginning of the year, this is kind of just like a natural rhythm in my home, is that at the beginning of the year when I've got a little time off that we just had, is I always find something in my house, a room, a closet, a drawer. And any of y'all got like that room, closet, or drawer that nobody wants to go into because it's just the everything room, everything drawer, everything closet. We have a guest bedroom that has a closet. It's one of those, like you open the door, throw it, and just, and just close the door real quick. You know what I'm talking about? It's like one of those, like, you don't even look in there. Because uh, if you look in there, you get a panic attack, and then it's just crazy. At least I do. This is mine. And so this, uh, this past weekend, that was my, I told Lindsay, like, I am tackling the guest bedroom. And she was like, you go, babe. All right? No. <laughs> Because she's not like that. Like, I'm the organizer in our house. If you need your life organized, come to me. I'll get it organized for you. So, like, I'm that type of guy. Like, I, I, everything's got to go to a certain place, pretty, a little OCD. We had all of our suitcases in there. We had, I mean, we had stuff everywhere. So, in, in order for that to happen, let me just give you a rule of thought of what happens. Everything's got to come. Everything's got to come out first. Okay? And then you've got to... I'm just helping y'all here, okay? For those who aren't as organized, let me just give you some of how this works. Everything comes out, then everything gets sorted. From, right? Everybody with me? Okay, so you got the, you got the keep, right? Then you got, the, you got the trash, okay? And then you got the, the giveaway, okay? Yeah, you got the giveaway, you got the giveaway. So the way here got highly blessed, let me just tell you that. Because it just kept, and so I've, you know, I've got all the family in, everybody's doing different things, we all got different projects, and so we've got like 23 different bags, I'm like, do we need all of these bags? So I'm going through all of that, and you know, a lot of it's going to trash, a lot of it's going out, and so then, then you begin the process of putting everything back, right? Suitcases can go into other suitcases, man, there's some tips, y'all, tips, okay? <laughs> Stuff getting stacked, got all that. Lindsay and I found, I found her wedding dress in there. She's like, I ain't putting that on. <laughs> I also found our letterman jackets. So both of us got our letterman jackets and we're going around the house <laughs> like we were in high school again. But it's all, so it's all, it's all good now. It's all, it's all organized. My soul is at peace. How I many of y'all know what that's like? It's just like, <sighs> I can breathe. Until you look in another room, you're like, I'm not even looking over there, okay? I'm at peace here. I'm at peace here. Here's why I bring this up. Because when you get saved, when you say yes to Jesus becoming not only your Savior for forgiveness of sins, but becomes your Lord, and the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of you, I just want to go ahead and give you a upfront, if you don't know this, the Holy Spirit will begin to start going room by room in your heart and start removing things that don't need to be there. Oh, we got some pride? We're going to deal with that. Oh, we got some lust? Oh, we're going to deal with that. Oh, we got some gossip? Oh, we're going to deal with that. And I'm just letting you know, if you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to be okay with him constantly doing spiritual inventory in your heart. And, and one of the ways that you know that you are wholeheartedly committed to the Lord, we've seen this with King Asa, is that there is a sensitivity. If there's anything in my life that is not pleasing to God, I want it gone. I don't play with the idols. I don't play around with the things. I remove it, and King Asa went to the point of I'm even smashing it. I'm destroying these things that are in my life. And when I hear Christians oftentimes go, man, I'm just struggling, I'm just struggling, I'm just struggling. And it's not like it's just a seasonal thing, but it's like an annual thing, and it's a constant thing. I always, I want, what I want to say is, pick up the hammer and take it to that thing. Let's destroy that thing. Well, this is just how I'm going to live. No, it's not how you have to live. I mean, no, you don't have to live in addiction and you don't have to live in depression and you don't have to live in despair and you don't have to live in sin and you don't have to continue to fall into temptation. You don't have to live there. 
And the Holy Spirit, if you have a working relationship with the Holy Spirit, he won't let you live there. He, he will keep you so uncomfortable. I'm just telling you, you'll come into church and it, you'll never be comfortable here. Because the Holy Spirit, he's always very specific and he'll start pointing things out. And this is what we see in King Asa. But, but notice that when, here's the crazy thing. The idols that are in our life that we think bring us peace actually just bring us more and more frustration. But when he finally dealt with the idols, the Bible said that everything was at peace. Some of you are longing for peace and you just realize you can't buy peace. But you can do things in your life to posture your heart to have peace. And so the first thing that we've got to do if we want to be wholehearted people to the Lord is there is a removal of anything that is in my life that is not honoring to the Lord. And it's, it's really only something that you and the Holy Spirit can do. That's, that's a work that you have to do with him. God, is there, is there anything in my heart? Is there anything in my life that, that needs to be removed? And I'm telling you, these next seven days of prayer and fasting is a perfect opportunity to go after that, to go after whatever it is. But the Bible says that no one tried to make war against them at this time for the Lord was giving him rest from his enemies. But if you've served God long enough, how many know that doesn't last long? Because it goes into number two. So the first thing is, is that we've got to remove anything that is not of God. The second thing is, is a reliance on God. A wholehearted commitment to God is a reliance on God because look at the next verse now in verse eight. Look at verse eight and it says this. It says, so King Asa had an army. Now this is huge here. When you ever see numbers, don't, don't just skip over numbers. I wanna help you understand things. You always need to kind of make notes of the numbers that are in scripture, that there were 300,000 warriors from the tribe of Judah armed with large shields and spears. He also had an army of 280,000 warriors from the tribe of Benjamin armed with small shields and bows. Okay, just real quick, any math people in here? What is that? Some of you are like, this is the new year. You're making me do school already? 580,000, okay, just wanna help you all out here. 580,000. Both armies were composed of well-trained fighting men. So he had 580,000 very well-trained fighting men. But once an Ethiopian named Zira attacked Judah with an army of one million men and 300 chariots, okay? So real quick, is a million more than 580,000? Okay, okay, just starting, we're starting easy. Okay, we're starting easy here. They advanced to the town of Maresh. So Asa deployed his armies for battle in the valley near of Maresh. Okay, okay, so <clears throat> he's been at peace for a little while, removed some things, removed some idols, smashed them. God's, been at, God's had the place at peace. Now we've got an intruding army that's coming in. He's got an army of 580,000. This army that's coming against him has an army of 1 million. Odds are a little against them, almost a two to one odds. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty severe situation that's going on. Getting encamped around, here it's coming against it. So King Asa fa faces an incredibly serious threat. And I want you to see how he responds. Because here's, here's the takeaway. Stress and pressure reveals where you put your trust. Let me say that again. Stress and pressure reveals where you put your trust. If you wanna know what you trust in, just let something happen to your money. Let something happen to your health. Let something happen to a relationship. Let some, let some kind of stress, some kind of pressure come and you're gonna, you're gonna find out very quickly where you put your faith, where you put your trust. And I want you to see, here's a man that loves God, how he responds got a million people coming against him. He doesn't have enough people to battle that. They're gonna easily take him out. And the next verse says this. So then Asa cries out to the Lord, his God, oh Lord, everybody help me here. No one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, oh Lord, our God. Here we go, for we trust you We trust in you alone. Now look, he keeps saying, he says this. It is in your name that we have come against this vast horde. Oh Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. So the question is, where do you go when you're under stress? King Asa here models to us, stress, pressure, 
something that's totally against him that he can't do, and he goes to the Lord, and he goes to the Lord. And I think we know this, there's a bit of this that we know this, and, and, and we understand that when we come to a place that is beyond our ability, that, that it is only God that we can seek. And we, our nation actually just proved this point this week. So I don't know if any of y'all saw, but this last Monday for Monday Night Football, there was a guy who literally had a, almost a massive cardiac arrest on the field. Anybody see that? I mean, it's all over the news. You can see it. Literally, a play dropped down and just didn't breathe for like nine minutes. They were recessing him on the field. Do you know what the players are doing? Look, I got a picture of it. Look at this. I guarantee you all these guys in here are not saved. Guarantee it. But these guys also realize when you get to the place where there's so much pressure and so much stress that you can't do it, there's only one posture you can have. There's only one. There's other postures you actually can't have, but there's only one that actually gets the, the answer. And so I, I don't know if y'all saw, then last night, last night, the, the, the teams started, this is how they started the game. Started the game again this way, of praying and believing. And then to take it even a whole nother step further this week, this is, I've never, ever seen this happen on ESPN, ever. But I wanna show you something that happened on ESPN. Play it, guys. Different. I heard, I've heard it all day, like thoughts and prayers. And you just heard Scherf and Jonathan Allen say, like, all we can do is pray for him. And I've heard the Buffalo Bills organization say, like, we believe in prayer. And maybe this is not the right thing to do, but I want to, it's just on my heart that I want to pray for it him. It is. Damar Hamlin right, right, right now. Um, I'm going to do it out loud. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to bow my head, and I'm just going to pray for him. Um, God, we come to you in these moments that we don't understand, that are hard, uh, because we believe that your God and coming to you and praying to you um, has impact. We're, we're sad, we're angry, um, and we want answers, but some things are unanswerable. We just want to pray, truly come to you and pray for strength for Damar, for healing for Damar, for comfort for Damar, to be with his family, to give them peace, if we didn't believe that prayer didn't work, we wouldn't ask this of you, God. Um, I believe in prayer. We believe in prayer. We lift up Damar Hamlin's name in your name. Amen. 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 I, I, when you get to that place in your life where there's nothing else to do, there's only one place to turn. And, and he, I'm always cautious to say this because I, I don't want this to be like, uh, it's a prophetic thing by any regards. But most of you in here are going to have a stress in your life that's gonna happen this year that's beyond you. Yeah. It's gonna happen. Yeah. And I wanna pre-prepare you for when that moment comes, whether it's a diagnosis, whether it's a tragedy, whether it's a hardship, that the first thing that you do is you say, oh Lord, help us, we're powerless without you. We can't do this without you. It is a full reliance and dependence upon the Lord. What does wholehearted commitment look like? A full dependence and reliance upon the Lord. And I don't know if y'all have actually been following Damar Hamlin's track, like he's doing well now, he's doing better. Like it's literally God's getting praise in the midst of a secular situation. Because people have realized like, hey, we're grateful for doctors and grateful for that, but notice they ain't praying to doctors. They ain't praying to medicine. They ain't, they're not like, hey, let's just get together and have some good energy. Like none of that. It's like, let's go to the Lord. Let's go to the Lord. And look what the, look what the next verse says when he, when he relies on the Lord. It says, so the Lord defeated the Ethiopians. And this is huge here because you've got to realize that, there, that there, there was a battle. And we're not exactly sure what even played out in this scenario, whether God literally just killed these people or God used them in a supernatural way. But all we know is that the Lord got the credit, 
And the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and in the army of, Judu uh, of Judah and the enemy fled and Asa and his armies pursued them as far as Gerar. And so many Ethiopians fell that they were unable to rally and they were destroyed, here we go yet again, by the Lord and his army. So there we do get it, that God used them to do it. So here's what I want you to realize though. When you're praying and asking the Lord to show up and God, I depend on you, doesn't mean that you're out of the equation. God will still use you to do the answer. So it's not like, God, you do it. God, I need help. God, Lord, take, take my finances and multiply them and give me a hundredfold and just put it in my bank account whenever you're ready. You know what God says? Go to work. <laughs> and then let me, let me have that boss bless you. And because you're a hard worker, like how many know uh, King Asa didn't go like, God, take them out. And we'll just sit back and watch and cheer you on. God says, okay, I'm gonna go to work, but you're going to work with me. We're gonna work together. This is a partnership. This is a reliance upon him. They were destroyed by the Lord and his army and the army of Judah carried off a vast amount of plunder. So Asa prays, God acts. Asa prays, God acts. Asa prays, God acts. And then Asa works with God. And this is what's gonna happen this year in 2023 as we begin next week, seek week. We're gonna pray, God's gonna go to work. I'm just letting you know, God's gonna go to work, but he's also gonna go to work with you. Y'all gonna go to work together. But every, how many know every time we're praying, God's acting even if we can't see it? God's acting, God's, God's doing it. This is the power of prayer. All right, number three, I gotta keep going. Number three is obedience to God. Obedience to God, so wholehearted commitment is a removal of anything not of God, a reliance on God and an obedience to God. Okay, let's read a lot more scripture. I told you we're gonna read some scripture here. So right after this victory happens, God defeats these million people army. Right after this happens, it says, the spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded, and he went out to meet the king Asa as he was returning from the battle. So the spirit of God speaks to this prophet Azariah. So he goes to the king and he says, listen to me, Asa. Okay, I've got a word from the Lord for you. Okay, so he's literally about to prophesy over him. He says, listen, all of you people of Judah and Benjamin, the Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever, everybody help me with these. Whenever you, that's a promise. And actually that's a promise all throughout scripture. Whenever you seek him, you're gonna find him. But, here's the but, right? But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God. They were without a priest to teach them. They were out without the law to instruct them. But whenever they were in trouble and they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him. So turning to the Lord is, I acknowledge you, Seeking the Lord, seeking after him is a pursuit of him. So not only did the people turn to him and acknowledge, okay, God, you can only help me, but then they begin to seek after God. And when they did that, what'd they do? What happened? They found him. So during those dark times, it was not safe to travel. Let's keep reading. Problems uh, troubled the people of every land. Nations fought against nations and cities against city for God was troubling them with every kind of of problem. Let's not skip over that for a moment. Go back. Did y'all see that? I wish I could just have it a little bit. For God was troubling them. We always rebuking Satan. Sometimes it's God. Next verse. But as for you, be strong and courageous for your work will be rewarded. And when Asa heard this message from Azariah the prophet, he took courage and he removed all the detestable idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin in the towns he had captured in the hill country of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar of the Lord which stood in front of the entry room of the Lord's temple. And obedience to God, so the spirit of God comes on a prophet the prophet has the boldness to come to the king. That's a big deal, by the way. Anytime you're gonna confront the king or say something to the king, comes to the king, says, hey, this is what's going on. 
And, and King Asa, because he's, he's, he's tender towards the Lord, he's soft-hearted towards the Lord, he says, okay, whatever the Lord wants me to do, I'm gonna do it. And he says, hey, listen, if you will seek God, you'll find God. If you abandon God, you're gonna be abandoned. But seek after him, do this. And so he, he says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna go after it. And the Bible says that, that he said, be strong and courageous. And then when Asa heard this, he got courage. Because every time as God is speaking to you, listen to me closely, one of the ways you know that God is speaking to you is it gives you courage, especially when it's stepping out to do something that maybe is against what's normal to you. But he gives this supernatural courage. You're going to see in just a minute a big thing that's about to happen, but, a, but when God speaks, it's always to press in, never to shrink back. Be strong and courageous. It's always to move forward. It's never to, to hold steady. It's never just to move back. It's always to press in. And here's what I know. I'm gonna just go ahead and tell you how this plays out. When you live wholehearted for God, it will offend people who live half-hearted. Man, why are you getting, why are you all like, why is, what's all about all this church stuff and all this God stuff? And man, what, what's up with you? Like, I'm just letting you know, when you go all in for God, it doesn't, not everybody likes it. But how many know we've got only one person to obey and it's not man and it's not people, it's God. So I'm gonna do a wholehearted obedience to God. Okay, I've got to hurry because, oh, this could be a three-part series, but I'm fitting it in one. Okay, so (laughs) number four is a covenant to seek God. So they make this covenant now to seek God. Let's keep rolling. Then Asa called together all the people of Judah and Benjamin. So he calls everybody. He gets this word from the Lord. Hey, if you seek me, I'll be with you. So he calls everybody together. Hey, listen, all campuses, everybody, we're coming together. Let's go, everybody. Everybody, all the people of Judah and Benjamin, along with the people of Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon, who had settled among them, the people gathered at Jerusalem in late spring during the 15th year of Asa's reign. And on that day, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 cattle, 7,000 sheep and goats. How many know that was a sacrifice? from the plunder they, that they had taken from the, from the battle, then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord. So this was a mutual, together agreement that we, as God's people, are going to seek. It's, it's the same as what a married couple do on their wedding day, making a covenant, these I do promises to one another. This is what they're doing before the Lord, the God of their ancestors. And not only are we just going to make a covenant to seek God, we're going to do it with what? All our heart and all our soul. Doesn't it sound like one of the commandments that Jesus says? Hey, what's the greatest commandment? Love God. It's all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And watch this. When they did this, there was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. Now watch this, this is huge here. Because they didn't just acknowledge God, they sought after him with all of their heart and soul. And for 35 years after this, there's peace, there's prosperity, there's purpose, there's rest. It's amazing. And you would think that the next verse after that 35 years of reigning in peace and prosperity. Idols are destroyed. God is elevated. They've been honoring the Lord. That the next verse would say, and Asa reigned with God faithfully until the end of his time. But that's not what it says. And I want you to see what happens. And here's where I want everybody to tune in for the last... 15 minutes. In the middle of peace and prosperity and rest, we can go from a full, wholehearted commitment to the Lord to be cold, half hearted to the Lord. It's amazing how everybody turns to the Lord when there's stress, pressure, but what happens when there's peace and rest? Question, will you still pursue the Lord wholeheartedly when your life is going good? Because the true test is not just do you seek God whenever life is beyond you, because of course you're going to seek God because you have no other options. Question though, what happens when you have options? 
what happens when you have money? What happens when the health is good? What happens when the marriage seems to be doing all right? What happens in all of that? And King Asa in this moment, look with me, next chapter, 35 years of peace, prosperity, rest, no wars, all is good. And in 2 Chronicles 16, verse one, the next verse says, and in the 36th year of Asa's reign, King Basha of Israel invaded Judah and fortified at Ramah in order to prevent anyone from entering or leaving King Asa's territory in Judah. So here we go, ready? Asa is facing another threat. Another army is coming against him. And you would think the last one, he had a million people against him. And he cried out to the Lord and said, we're helpless without you. And here we go, 35 years later, his 36th year of reigning, another army comes against him. And the expectation is, he goes, God, we can't do this without you. But he doesn't. Look what the next verse says. Asa responded by removing the silver and gold from the treasuries of the temple of the Lord and the royal palace. He took some of the, the resources from the church, from God's church, and he sent it to King Ben-Hadad of Aram who was ruling in Damascus along with this message. Hey, let there be a treaty between you and me like the one between your father and my father. See, here's what's gonna happen. I'm sending you silver and gold and I want you to break your treaty with King Baash of Israel so that he will leave me alone. King Asa goes from a wholehearted commitment to God and over the course of 35 years and we're not exactly sure what is played out other than that he's in a place of prosperity and everything's good but over the course of 35 years he goes from wholehearted to half-hearted. And here we are in a moment where the enemy is against him and instead of him crying out to the Lord, he does something totally different. So here's the switch now. I wanna show you what half-hearted commitment to God looks like. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these three things down real quick. We're coming to the end. Three things down of what half-hearted commitment looks like. Number one is a reliance on self. Notice that whenever the enemy came against him, he didn't cry out to the Lord this time. This time he says, I could figure it out. Let me take some money from the church and I'll go pay somebody off and I'll form a treaty. We'll get together. We'll take this guy out. No reliance on the Lord whatsoever. He's gonna rely on himself. I've got this. And I'm gonna tell you, listen, as a pastor that's been pastoring for 22 years, I have pastored way too many people out of tragedy, out of hardship, out of place. We've gotten them to a place of health and then they've left not just left the church, left God. And it blows my mind because I'm like, you wouldn't be where you are today if it wasn't for God. And yet the one person who has made you who you are, you have abandoned. Because now you go, I got it. I don't need God anymore. Thanks God, appreciate you. I'll see you at Christmas. I got it, I'm good. Or... I'll see you when the next tragedy that happens that's beyond me. And so, there, because there's just a full on reliance of self. I've got this, I've got this. Here's what I know, I'm gonna just tell you how this plays out. If you rely on yourself, God will leave you to yourself so you can figure it out on your own. Yep. Anybody been there before? <laughs> got the t-shirt? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. So let me, get, let me show you, so here's number two. Number two is you seek others. That's, a, that's another half-hearted commitment to God is the first, it's okay, listen, it's okay to ask people for help. It's okay to ask people for prayer. It's okay to seek counsel and all that stuff. But that shouldn't be first. That, that should be a little bit down the list. The first thing is I seek the Lord. So there's not only a reliance on self, the second thing is, is that I'm seeking other people for validation. I'm trying to get help from other people. He tried to get help from another king. No, well, hold on, you're, 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 yet again, you're trying to get things from other people that you should be getting from God. And every time you try to get things from other people that you should be getting from God, you will always be let down. Because you're putting a God expectation on people that they can never, never fulfill. Your spouse can't be God, your best friend can't be God, and so what ends up happening is, is they hurt you, and then you're like, well, I'm done with them. Well, you're done with them because you put an expectation on them to do something that only God can do for you. 
And so a half-hearted commitment to God is I'm looking to everybody else, I'm looking to pills, I'm looking to a bottle, I'm looking to a person, I'm looking to something else to fulfill something in my heart that should only be fulfilled from God himself. And King Asa got to this place. He's like, I'll figure this out. I know how, to, I'll know how this works now. I've got this. So he, he, he relies on himself, he seeks others, and here's number three, and this is the scariest one, is he begins to reject God's voice. He rejects God's voice. Everybody still with me? Okay, we in? All right. He rejects God's voice. Look what happens here. Verse seven and nine. At that time, Hananiah the seer, another prophet. Okay, so we got a prophet earlier that said, hey, King Asa, you seek God, you'll find God. You stay with God, he stays with you. You leave God, ain't gonna be good. So that's the first prophet. Now, 35 years later, we've got another prophet. Hananiah comes to King Asa and told him, because you have put your what? Trust. Your trust in the king, not the king, in a king of Aram, instead of in the Lord your God, you missed your chance to destroy the army of the king of Aram. Don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians and the Libyans and their vast army? Have you got spiritual amnesia? You forgot what God did? Hey, can we all be honest? Don't we get that often? God, I don't know how I'm gonna make it. Don't you remember how God provided for you? Don't you remember what God did for you with all of their chariots and all of their charioteers? I don't know if that's like girl chariots or something. I don't know, charioteers. So, and at that time, you relied on the Lord and you handed them, and, and he handed them over to you. And here we go, here's our verse. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you have been. From now on, you will be at war. All right, here we go, three things. Let's go quick. Three things that happens when you, when you begin to have a half-hearted heart for the Lord and you reject God's voice, there's three things that happen. They happen every time. First thing is you have missed opportunities. Notice that scripture said, when he said it, you missed your chance. God was gonna handle it for you, it was gonna be taken care of, but you missed your chance. Because you wanted to depend on yourself, you got yourself. And you missed a moment for God to step up and do something for you. You dealt with your own depression instead of bringing it to the Lord. So now you get to handle it. You missed your chance. I was gonna heal you in that moment, but you missed it. I was gonna take care of you in that moment, but you missed it because you relied on yourself. You missed your opportunity there. How many of you in here, let's be honest, and I'm raising both, both of my hands here, have missed opportunities because you did it your way. Anybody? Yeah. Missed opportunities, missed opportunities. Second one, missed strength, missed strength. That the eyes of the Lord are searching throughout this earth, looking for people whose, whose hearts are fully committed to him so he can make them strong. He wants to strengthen them. And there is a strength that God is trying to give us, church, that if we're not leaning in on him and depending on him, you miss that strength. So some of you in here, you know this past year, you've been so weak, you've been so deflated, you've been so defeated. You're missing strength that God's trying to give to you. God wants you to have this strength. He's not withholding it from you, but he wants to only give it to people who are wholeheartedly committed to him. And then last one right here, all of us get this one, is constant conflict. When we reject the voice of God, there is constant conflict and stress and pressure that is in our life. This last verse says, and you will, find, you will always be at war. King Asa, you had peace for 35 years. Everything was good, all was well, you were seeking me, but now you wanna do your own thing and you're gonna get your own thing. And not only am I removing myself from you, you're gonna have missed opportunities, you're gonna have missed strength, but guess what? You're gonna always have turmoil. Your life is gonna be constant stress now. You're gonna constantly get, why? I don't think it's because God put it on him. I think what it is is God removed himself and he just got all that he wanted. Hey, listen to me. I don't think God puts that stuff on us. I think we just do it our own way. We put it on ourselves. Stress and pressure and problems. Look at verse 10. And so Asa became so angry with Hananiah for saying this, that he threw him into prison. The man of God that loved him, that wanted to see him 
loved Jesus with all of his heart. He put him in stocks. And at that time, Asa then began to oppress some of his very own people. Here's, watch this. When you live wholehearted before the Lord and God brings a word to you, it brings conviction. When you live half-hearted to the Lord and God brings a word to you, it doesn't bring conviction. You know what it does? It, it, I mean, it, it, it brings uh, like a, it brings conviction, but to the point where you reject it. You reject it. When you're wholehearted for God, it's like courage. It's conviction, but it's courage. The other one is conviction and you can't wait to get out of here. You can't wait to get away from that. And so what he does is the only people who spoke truth in his life, he kicked them out of his life. Y'all seen people do that? The only people who actually love them enough to be gracious with them and help them and give them truth, they've kicked them all out. This is what King Asa did. He came to a place where he started oppressing the people and he started having, he started kicking out, he, he imprisoned the one that it is. And watch, here we go, verse 12 and 13. And in the 39th year, Asa developed a serious foot disease. Most scholars believe that this is gout. Gout. Oh my God, this is the worst. And yet even with the severity of his disease, he did not seek the Lord's help, but he turned only to his physicians. So he died in the 41st year of his reign. That is the saddest last verse of someone's life. Hey, King Asa, what's going on? Man, listen, I got this like serious foot thing, man. It's just bothering me, it's hurting me. Oh, dude, did you, have you like prayed? Pfft, pray, I don't even pray. I just go to my, my doctor, my, what is that, a podiatrist? Is that what that is? Yes. Okay, thank y'all, good, got that. Got a good podiatrist. No, you, you just missed an opportunity yet again. You just missed an opportunity yet again for God to show up. Think about this, from year 35, I mean, 36, all the way to 41, the last five years of Asa's life is marked by physical and spiritual decline. And in these three chapters, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, seeking God is mentioned nine times. And at the end of King Asa's life, he is no longer seeking God. And as a pastor, this puts the fear of the Lord in me because I have seen firsthand so many pastors and leaders and Christians who started out on fire for the Lord and now don't wanna have anything to do with God. Could it happen to us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. Tony Evans said it this way, past spiritual victory does not guarantee future, future spiritual success. Committing oneself to God's agenda is a day-to-day -day experience. So let me ask this question to all of us in here. What's the state of your heart? Because this could happen to all of us this year. We could start this whole year off with seek week and going after the Lord and God starts answering things, your marriage starts getting a little bit better, and then all of a sudden, come February, March, April, May, it's just this digression of, man, I'm not really in church anymore, I'm not connected anymore, I'm not in life groups anymore, I just really don't even want to go to church anymore, I don't even really read God's word anymore. It can happen. And for some of you, it has happened. And for some of you, you're there now. But you're here in this room today. And I wanna read this last scripture, Psalms 86, 11. Says this, teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely, there's that word, on your faithfulness. Here we go, give me a what? Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear your name. The primary war in your life is for the allegiance of your heart. You can go through life without an arm. You can go through life without a foot. You cannot go through life without a heart. And the enemy knows that. 
And so he's not going after that. He's going after your heart. And I pray that we could maybe just turn this sanctuary into a little spiritual surgery room right now. And if you would be just honest with me and really honest before the Lord, I wanna ask you this question. Have you lost your fervor? Have you lost your passion? And you remember a time in your life, where, man, I just I felt like I was so close to the Lord. I feel like I'm so distant from the Lord right now. I think there's more of us in this room that resonate with that than maybe we care to admit. But you don't stumble into a great relationship with God. You seek it. And I'll give you this last, this last thought, and that is a half-hearted response is inappropriate to a God who wholeheartedly loves you. A half-hearted response is inappropriate to give to a God who wholeheartedly loves you. How many know God, God did not half-heartedly love you? God did not half-heartedly pursue you. God, how many know the cross is not a half-hearted response? It is a full-hearted response. God is all in. How many know he spared no expense to come after you? He is 100% wholehearted. And watch this. All he demands and asks is an equal response. You want all of me? Give me all of you. I don't know any of y'all in here that got married that when you got up here today, when you got up on that wedding day and you said, hey, I do, and the other person said, I, I do some days. <laughs> I mean, no, you run them right back down that lane and you're like, peace out, peace out. No, 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 listen, you, I, hey, I'm going all in, I do, and you expect them to go, I'm going all in, I do. Last time I checked, Come on, how many know he's going all in to give us eternal life? He's going all in to give us forgiveness. He's going all in to give us purpose. He's going all in to give us rest. He's going all in to give us all the things that we long for. God has gone all in, wholehearted, 100%. And he says, let me tell you what I want in 2023. I want to seek a people who are willing to go all in for me. Wholehearted. Everything you got. Everything you got. So I want to challenge you. Give us a year. I always do this, but I always wanna do this on the front end of the year. Give us a year, go, go all in for Jesus this year. Get plugged in, get connected, get around people. Get to church when you're here. Get as, as much as you can get in with everything that you have. Go all in. I wanna be a wholehearted church. I want when the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout Jennings and Iota and Gadon and Welsh and all of Jeff Davis Parish and Acadia Parish and St. Landry Parish and he's looking for a people who he can show himself strong on their behalf that he says, our Savior's church is the one that I wanna do that on. These are the people. These are the people. And I pray that for you. I pray that he, as he looks over this area, he sees your home. He says, that's the home I want to bless. That's the home I want my favor and my strength upon. D.L. Moody put it this way. We're done. The world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. And by God's help, I aim to be that man. You can put that as a woman. I aim to be that woman. I aim to be that and if that's you that's in this room this year, and you're like, I'm, I, I'm recommitting this. I wanna go all in. I know I haven't gone all in. I wanna go all in. 2023 is the beginning of a year for me to go, God, I wanna seek you. I wanna go all in for you. I don't wanna be half-hearted anymore. I wanna be full-hearted. That's you. I want you to stand up all across this room. That's you. Stand up, stand up. And only stand up if you mean it. If you don't mean it, that's fine. You can sit right there where you are. But if you mean that, I want you to stand with me. And would you just lift your hands all across this place, all across this room, and we're gonna just allow God just in this moment to do some spiritual assessing of our hearts. If there's areas of your heart that have been half-hearted before him, would you just right there where you are just say, God, would you just remove these things? And if you, even, if you know what those things are, just begin to ask the Lord, God, would you just remove these things? Remove independence from me. Remove pride from me. God, remove gossip from me. God, remove jealousy from me. God, remove me wanting to do my own thing from me. God, we repent. We repent today that we've turned to other things as false substitutes. God, we repent of that. God, we wanna be a church and wanna be a people, Lord, who go whole, all in, wholehearted, full, 100% to you. 
God, help us, help us, help us. We recognize our reliance upon you, our dependence upon you. We can't do this under our own strength. And God, I pray for those that are in this room right now, Lord, that, that, that they've had that season of life where they've been wayward, they've gone from you. But today you have them here. You have them watching online right now for this reason, for this purpose, to draw them back to yourself. So God, we make a commitment today. We make a commitment today to depend on you, to rely on you, to seek you first above all things. Seek you above money. Seek you above, uh, of, above claim and, and acclimates. God, we pray right now, Lord, that you would be the, the first of our posture of our heart that we wake up in the morning and we seek you first. Wholehearted devotion to you. Wholehearted devotion. Would you just say this out loud? Say, Jesus, you can have my heart. Have your way in my life in 2023. Give me ears to hear what you're speaking to me. Give me courage to obey what your voice is telling me. May this year be a year that you receive all the glory from my life. May my words, my thoughts, and my actions bring you glory in all that I do. We surrender our life to you. Help us, Holy Spirit, fill us in Jesus' name. Amen.